Good morning. Uh, we're so happy you could join us for Sunday morning at Church of the Revelation. Uh, usually we have a message and then a deep dive so we can, um, you know, delve into the uh, just whatever it is, the revelation that God has given us. So we're very excited that you can join us this morning. Um, you know, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this blessed day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And um, uh, dear God, this is a season of giving. And uh, we just pray, Father, that uh, you know, we look at the landscape, what's going on in the world. There's um, so much need. And so we pray for wisdom, for understanding that, um, you know, we'll address the areas that we can. Give us courage, dear Father, not to be uh, self-centered in our efforts. Just guide and lead us, dear God, I pray, in the way we should go. And this morning I pray the same, in Jesus' name, amen. So we looked last week at how, you know, songs play this, um, <clears throat> this play a role in, um, in our, in our, not just so in worship, but in our transformation, right? Um, scripture says we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And, and you know, when you're, con um, when you're converted, you learn language from the world. And, and so, um, you know, songs, songs that given by the Holy Spirit are a good way to transition our thoughts and transition our minds so that we don't speak to each other in the way that we um, <clears throat> in the way that we used to but that our language is seasoned with salt you know um, out of uh, out of the bellies of those who are in Christ and know Christ come rivers of living water and um, and you know the language of the world usually tears down not build up so so we um, we need to learn how to build up rather than tear down and so um, it says that we should speak to each other in psalms and hymns making melody in our hearts to the Lord always and um, you know giving thanks and so you could see how it it requires a different type of um, a different type of thinking. I mean, I was well versed in the songs of the world at one time, and um, <clears throat> and I remember making that transition that I um, <laughs> I had like I don't know how much I had so many records, and um, and so when I made the transition and had to. I didn't realize, you don't realize how much you have until you start trying to get rid of something. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it, 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 it took some doing, you know, because, because the songs had meaning and, <clears throat> you know, there were a lot of memories to songs. And now we are building, we're building a different type of, um, a different type of, of testimony with our lives. And so <clears throat> we're having different songs that have different meanings set your minds on things above so things more consistent with who God is, where God is, who we are in relation to who God is in those type of things, you know, and and um, the other thing too is that, you know, it says Psalm 22 says that God inhabits the praises of his people Israel. So it, it's more than, um, you know, singing in the spirit is more than just putting words together. It's, uh, it's allowing God to, to be a part of, speak through us, speak in us, reveal to us things that, um, you, know, we, you know, we get through and we're like, wow, you know, where did that come from type deal. You know, um, God has put together a songbook for us to use and to give him an opportunity to instruct us in wisdom and understanding. So we're not tossed to and... Um, and fro in terms of the nature of God and the character of the one that we call Father, who we call Father. It's important to know the nature and character of God as this gives us a better understanding of grace, a word that we use so loosely sometimes. 
but also so we can understand our position, you know, as children, his position as, uh, as, as sovereign, his position as father, that our father is the sovereign Lord, that our father is the creator of the universe, and that our father holds all things together. Sometimes we can, you know, we can forget God's position when we go through our every day, especially living in a world where it's easy to forget the, um, the goodness unless reminded because there is so much going on that is not good. Yeah, I remember, <clears throat> you know, Hannah, Samuel's mother, she sang to the Lord when, when her prayer was answered and God granted her a son. And um, she was dedicating Samuel to, um, to the uh, service of God and, and consider the words of, of, her, of her prayer. And you, know, and, and you can consider it for song because it's, um, you know, in it you can see, you can see how, you know, you can see where it says the Lord fulfills, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. You can, you can see in these words, and, I, and I'm just, I'll just take a part of it, you can see in these words how God is involved in, in what she's saying. It says, um, for the, in 1 Samuel 2, 9, it says, for the, for the foundations of the song of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, <clears throat> but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It's not by strength that one prevails. Verse 10 says, Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. You know, it's good to be reminded, right, of God's position when we hear of all the things that can, you know, that man predicts for this world. We see and experience the power of nature and the thundering and lightning should remind us that there's a tremendous, there's tremendous power that can be experienced at the hand of God. But he chooses to be known more for his love and the power that is available to overcome what would hinder us from experiencing his love. The Lord will guard the feet of his faithful servants. How comforting is that? The Lord will guard the feet, the, 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 the feet of his, his faithful servants, guide us <clears throat> where we walk when we're faithful. To be faithful is, not, is to not rely on one's strength, but to rely on the power of God who will, who will judge the ends of the earth. How comforting to know that judgment belongs to God. And we don't have to spend time consumed with how things are going to turn out and, 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 and how it's going to go in, in how this is all, how this is all going to come. God tells us how it's all going to come to, um, what's going to come to fruition, how it's all going to end, his position, what he's going to do. You know, judgment begin at the house of God, Peter said. And if it starts with us, then what shall the end be for those who know not God? But, you know, judgment begins at the house of God. Do you think of it? You know, God starts with us, right? He, he, takes, care of, he takes care of what would, what would not be of Him in us first and, and, and then go outward. So in knowing that, you know, we can... We can, we can start with us and, and we, can, we can look internally at the things that are not consistent with God. And I believe singing songs about what is consistent with God will help remind us so that we, are, um, so that we, can, we can be pleasing to our Father and, and be involved in what He's doing. Interesting that Hannah refers to God's relationship with his king and anointed when there was no kingdom established in Israel. She was in the process of dedicating Samuel, her son, to God's service. He would be the one to anoint the first king of Israel, Saul, and then David, and establish a line from which Christ would come. 
But at the time of the song, no thought of a king as yet. But she spoke of the kings linked to God in their position by way of um, their anointing. So you see how God, <clears throat> God inhabits the praise, her praise, and, and gave her words that, you know, someone would probably ask her, what are you talking about? <clears throat> you know what I mean? But we, but again, now this is, it's historical what happened, but at the time you can see how God was, um, her words were prophetic. Now God has less left us a collection of songs to be our guide to praise. They're not random, but the Psalms are a collection of songs and prayers to be sung that are arranged in a particular way. So I want us to look at this, you know, just take a look and listen to this from the Bible Project. I'm going to try to share here, so um, bear with me a second. The Book of Psalms, it's a collection of 150 ancient Hebrew poems, songs, and prayers that come from all different periods in Israel's history. Many of these poems are connected with King David, 73 actually, and he was known as a poet and a harp player. The Book of Psalms, it's a collection of 150 ancient Hebrew poems, songs, and prayers that come from all different periods in Israel's history. Many of these poems are connected with King David, 73, actually, and he was known as a poet and a harp player. But there are many different authors behind these poems. There's the poems of Asaf, or from the sons of Korah, and some are from other worship leaders in the temple. Even Solomon and Moses have their own poems, and nearly one-third of these are anonymous. Now, many of these poems came to be used by the choirs that sang in Israel's temple, but the Book of Psalms is actually not a hymn book. At some point in the period after Israel's exile to Babylon, these ancient poems were gathered together and intentionally arranged into the book of Psalms before us. And it has a very unique design and message that you're not going to notice unless you read it from beginning to end. Now to see how the book of Psalms is designed, it's actually most helpful to start at the end. The book concludes with five poems of praise to the God of Israel, and each one begins and ends with the word hallelujah, which is Hebrew for a command to tell a group of people to praise Yah, which is short for the divine name Yahweh. Now, that's a really nice five-part arrangement, and it looks like someone's giving us a conclusion here to the book. So, it invites the question, does the book have any other signs of intentional design? If you pay attention to the headings of the poems, you'll notice that at five places, your Bible translators have the heading book one, book two, book three, four, and five at various points, and that these divide the book into five large sections. Now the reason for this is that the final poem in each of those sections have a very similar ending that looks like an editorial edition. It reads something like, May the Lord, the God of Israel, be blessed forever and ever. Amen and amen. So the book has a conclusion. It has an internal organization into five main parts. And so the natural place to go from here is now the beginning to look for an introduction. And what do we find? Psalms 1 and 2 which stand outside of book one because most of the poems in book one are linked to David except Psalms one and two, which are anonymous. Psalm one celebrates how blessed the person is who meditates on the Torah, prayerfully reading it day and night and then obeying it. Now the word Torah simply means teaching and more specifically it came to refer to the five books of Moses that begin the Old Testament. And here actually the word seems to be used with both meanings in mind, which explains why it has five main parts. The book of Psalms is being offered as a new Torah that will teach God's people the lifelong practice of prayer as they strive to obey God's commands given in the first Torah. Psalm 2 is a poetic reflection on God's promise to King David from 2 Samuel chapter 7, that one day a messianic king would come and establish God's kingdom over the world, defeat evil and rebellion among the nations. Now Psalm 2 concludes by saying that all of those who take refuge in the messianic king will be blessed, precisely the word used to open Psalm 1. And so together, these two poems tell us that the book of Psalms is designed to be the prayer book of God's people, 
as they strive to be faithful to the commands of the Torah as they hope and wait for the future messianic kingdom. Now with these two themes introduced, we can start to see how the smaller books have been designed as well around these two ideas. So for example, book one has right at the center a collection of poems, Psalms 15 through 24, that opens and closes with a call to covenant faithfulness. And then Psalm 16 to 18, we find a depiction of David as a model of this kind of faithfulness. So he calls out to God to deliver him, and God elevates him as king. Now, in the corresponding set of poems, Psalms 20 to 23, the David of the past has become an image of the messianic king of the future, who will also call out to God, he will be delivered, and then given a kingdom over the nations. And then right at the center of this collection is a poem, Psalm 19, dedicated to praising God for the Torah. So here we go. The two themes from Psalms 1 and 2 are bound together tightly here. Book 2 opens with two poems that are united in their hope for a future return to the temple in Zion. And this is an image closely associated with the hope of the Messianic kingdom. Then book 2 closes with a poem that depicts the future reign of the Messianic king over all of the nation. This poem's really amazing because it echoes all these other passages from the prophets about the messianic kingdom. And it concludes by saying that this king's reign will bring about the fulfillment of God's ancient promise to Abraham to bring God's blessing to all of the nations. Book three also concludes with a poem reflecting on God's promise to David, but this time in light of Israel's exile. So the poet remembers how God said he would never abandon the line of David. But now he's looking at Israel's rebellion and its result in destruction and exile and the downfall of the line of David. And so the poet ends by asking God to never forget his promise to David. Book four is designed to respond to this crisis of exile. So the opening poem returns us back to Israel's roots with a prayer of Moses. And he does what he did on Mount Sinai after the golden calf incident, which is to call upon God to show mercy. The center of Book 4 is dominated by a group of poems that announce that the Lord, the God of Israel, reigns as the true king of the world, and that all creation, trees, mountains, rivers, are all summoned to celebrate that future day when God will bring his justice and kingdom over all the world. Book 5 opens with a series of poems that affirm that God hears the cries of his people and will one day send the future king to defeat evil and bring God's kingdom. This book also contains two larger collections, one called the Hollow and the other called the Songs of Ascent. Each one of these collections concludes with a poem about the future messianic kingdom. And these two collections together, they sustain the hope for a future Exodus-like act of God to redeem his people. And then, right between them is Psalm 119. It's the longest poem in the book. It's an alphabet poem. Each line begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it explores the wonder and the gift of the Torah as God's word to his people. So here we go. The themes from Psalm 1 and 2, Torah and Messiah, combine all together here in Book 5, which brings us all the way back to that five-poem conclusion. In the center poem, Psalm 148, all creation is summoned to praise the God of Israel because he has, quote, raised up a horn for his people. Now the horn here, it's a metaphor of a bull's horn raised in victory. And this image echoes back to the same image used in Hannah's song for Samuel chapter 2, but also to the earlier Psalm 132. The horn is a symbol for the future messianic king and his victory over evil. It's a fitting conclusion to this amazing book. Now here's one more thing that you are likely going to miss if you don't read this book in order. There's lots of different kinds of poems in the book of Psalms, but they all basically fall into two big categories, either poems of lament or poems of praise. Poems of lament express pain, confusion, and anger about how horrible the world is and how horrible the things are happening to the poet. And so these poems draw attention to what's wrong in the world, and they ask God to do something about it. There's a lot of these in the book, which tells us something important, that lament is an appropriate response to the evil that we see in our world. But what you'll notice is that lament poems predominate earlier in the book, in books one through three. But pay attention, because you'll see praise poems occasionally, too. Praise poems are poems of joy and celebration, and they draw attention to what's good in the world, and they retell stories of what God has done in our lives and thank God for it. In books four and five, you'll notice that praise poems come to outnumber lament poems. And it all culminates in that five-part hallelujah conclusion. 
So this shift from lament to praise, this is profound. And it tells us something about the nature of prayer. As we hope for the messianic kingdom, as the book teaches us to do, this will create tension for us as we look out on the tragic state of our world and of our lives. And so the Psalms teach us not to ignore the pain of our lives, but at the same time, biblical faith is forward-looking, looking to the promise of God's future messianic kingdom. And so Torah and Messiah, lament and praise, faith and hope, that's what the book of Psalms is all about. Okay, so you can see that the Psalms are, um, they're not just a, 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 a good read for a rainy day, but a collection of books <clears throat> that can help us organize our thoughts as we learn to communicate with God. And eventually we'll learn how to pray as, you know, guided by God in terms of how we experience His grace. But again, rightly dividing the word of truth allows us to gain insight and knowledge that can allow the prayers offered by Paul in the letters to the churches to be answered in our lives. Consider Ephesians 1, 15 through 19, where he prayed, you know, he said, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. This is a prayer that we should pray for each other, isn't it? That, that God would open the eyes of our hearts so we can, we, we can be enlightened to know the hope of our calling so that we are not you know, only focused on what our earthly eyes can behold. Our hope is that God gives us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we can know Him better. Knowing God is eternal life. Knowing Christ is eternal life, John 17, 3. So our efforts in all of this is to assist with, um, you know, with this knowing of God. And, and you can see that God has given us tremendous insight into, in, in different ways, into what the, the meaning of what He's done, meaning of what He's doing now, and also uh, insight into what is to come, how we can put it together. And it's interesting that, you know, in the, um, when we look at how the Psalms, even how they're, how they're organized, that we can see that, that God is, he is interested in us, past, present, and future, how we relate to each other, how we relate to him, and that we have understanding of what's going on. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And so, you know, again, him being the way, the truth, and the life basically means something to us on a daily basis because if, if, God, is being, if God is being expressed through us, then, then the way, the truth, and the life is being expressed through us. The light of God shining through us allows him to be glorified in the world by the things that we do. So, you know, the, the scriptures help us to develop practices that allow God to dwell in our efforts and allow His light to shine in and through us into the darkness of the world. With thanksgiving, we, we should at least be involved by way of prayer. The prayer of faith of a righteous person is very important as we live in relationship with each other. And as we learn to offer praise, we learn how to speak to each other with words that lift up and encourage each other. It has to be intentional about, you know, changing our speech to reflect what's going on inside our hearts by learning how to praise God in songs and hymns given us by His Holy Spirit. 
And you know, right, reading the the reading the, the what he has given us already, and, and first of all, it, it's you know it's interesting that we could, you know, we can get so involved in the Psalms instead of just you know we could just read them randomly, but they tell a story, right? They tell a story past, present, and future. And, uh, and you know, we can, we can draw from what we're reading, and, but coupled with the message of grace, we can understand our purpose, especially it says that the latter part of the, uh, the latter part of the Psalms are about praises. You know, it, it, it's interesting that the first half of it it is more um, lament, and the second half of it is more praise. But it's interesting that the first half of it is is, is really about the time under the um, the time on the, under the under the law for God's people, and of course the purpose of the law was to define sin and show sin to be exceedingly sinful, and so looking out of the landscape of the world, <clears throat> for instance, you know, David, he could, um, he, it seems sometimes like he gets, he gets so wrapped up in, in what those who are, um, those who are unrighteous are doing, but coupled with that, you could see how there's a distinction because he will always, he will always add his position in all of that, but I will, I will sing praise to God, and, and, and God is my fortress, and, 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 and you know, I look to the hills where your, where your strength comes from. I look to the hills where my strength comes from, he says, and, and he sings about, you know, um, dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. And, and again, like I said, he did all that, and, and there was no temple at the time, but, but a lot of the, the um, when God gets involved, then a lot of these writings become prophetic. And so getting wrapped up in song is, um, it's, a, it's a good way to engage the Holy Spirit. And we'll look at some of these Psalms and, and you'll see that, that um, they, it, it takes meditation to really get what the writer is saying. But if you meditate on it, uh, you'll see that that it, it really paints a picture of God that is, um, I have another, another video to show you next week that gives a different, paints such, such a, a, a different picture as to the meaning behind the, the Psalms, especially without the temple. And so, um, and so we look at that and, and probably shed some light as far as we're concerned because we are the temple we are the temple of the living God, and the temple was a place where, you know, the, the stories of God would be, uh, you, you would go to see the stories of God on the uh, mosaics, on the wall, and stuff like that. So without that, <clears throat> you know, the, um, the collection of writings that tells the story become even more important. But it also gives a, a picture of how important it is that the story of God and the story of God's presence in the world and God's plan be told in his temple. And as the temple of the living God, then that now becomes our, it now becomes um, our task to do. So anyway, um, we'll look some more of that, but you know, songs and hymns, that reflect the plan of God as he touches our lives in all areas on a daily basis. When we engage in those, we are reminded, but also it allows us to be transformed, our minds to be transformed so that, you know, we can um, first set our minds on things above and it kind of helps, um, helps our speech so that we speak from the abundance of the heart. And if Christ is the abundance of the heart, then, um, then that also permeates our speech. Amen? So let us pray. Father, we thank you for uh, just 
And we thank you, dear God, that you, your word is a lamp to our feet, a light unto our path, and that, and that, dear God, if we, if we have your word and get your word inside of us, that it will transform our minds and transform our hearts so that, dear God, we can, you know, we can, we can um, experience you in such a way that our thoughts will be uplifting thoughts and uh, our speech to each other would be words that lift each other up and, <clears throat> and as, we, um, as we encounter the world that your light will shine through us so that others may glorify you based on how we speak to them and based on the things that we do. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.